Hello, I'm Makar Rizvi, and this is Scope. In the first segment of today's show, we're going to discuss colonial era as well as Confederate symbols, statues, monuments, etc. Um, there is now some controversy surrounding all of the above, and there has been for a significant amount of time now, especially when it comes to Confederate symbols in the U.S., that is. Um, and of course, now colonial era symbols in places like the U.K., even Belgium, and others have now come into the spotlight ever since we've had this, this very latest round of anti-racism protests around the world. All of this sparked, of course, as we know, by the uh, killing of George Floyd in the U.S. Um, is this the time, is this the right time to be going after these statues? Is it, as many people say, that these statues are, in fact, representative of a respective nation's heritage and history and should, in fact, be preserved? Or is it, as others would argue, that they're actually symbols of slavery, of, of oppression, of injustice, of colonialism, et cetera, around the world, and that they should be taken down and not, in fact, idealized. Let's uh, discuss all of that a bit further with our panelists who are joining us. We're joined by Karen L. Cox, who is a professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She's, her forthcoming book is on the history of Confederate monuments, and it's entitled No Common Ground. She's joining us now this morning from Charlotte, North Carolina. Also joining us from Bournemouth in the UK is Jonathan Hines, who's the co-founder and presenter at UK Talk Radio. And he's also formerly producer and presenter of Talk Solent on That's Solent TV. Jonathan and Karen, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Karen, I'd like to start with you. Um, I know you've uh, researched uh, these sorts of monuments a lot, especially, of course, in the U.S. Um, what, are your, what is your opinion uh, right now on the very negative sentiments surrounding them and the efforts in some parts, of course, to have all of these taken down? Well, first of all, thank you um, for having me here. I think that um, uh, what needs to be understood is that there is a long history of uh, critique about of these monuments from the African-American community uh, since they went up over a century ago. And so the, the recent um, protests, which are much more public um, and, and active than they've ever been before, um, to me is just part of a longer legacy of protest, uh, some of which may have only been verbal in the past, but now it's become physical. And um, the problem has been, of course, that um, their thoughts about these monuments and, and the way it makes them feel uh, has been ignored. And um, we've come to a point where um, people are going to decide um, about these monuments in their communities one way or the other and without, with or without government assistance on that. Now, Jonathan, what's about that? Because I know this has created controversy in the UK, too, where I, I think a, a, a slave trader's um, statue was pulled down, and that was condemned by Preeti Patel. Good afternoon, Wakar. Um, I think um, that it's one of those cases where people, um, you know, they have a great cause. You know, very nobody could argue with, with the cause um, you know, and the pain and, and suffering in, of slavery in history. No one could disagree that this is distasteful and people need to be um, educated about it and they need to know about it and we need to be aware of it and mindful of it. But people, uh, by getting so um, chaotic and emotional in these protests, in my view, they're undermining um, their cause. They're undermining the good work they could be doing. Um, they're, 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 they're sabotaging it by being so... Um, by being so chaotic, so uncontrolled, uh, and, and, and so messy in the way that they're doing things. Um, if you had, you know, a really strong protest or sit-in where, you know, thousands of people unite and, you know, and write letters and petitions and peacefully protest, of course, uh, eventually you can get these statues, the ones that are associated with slavery, um, removed. Of course, that can happen, and you have to believe that you can achieve that. But uh, violence and, and chaos and, and pulling physically pulling things down and and that sort of those sort of messy scenes are not appropriate. Unfortunately, can often sabotage a great cause and 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 turn people against a cause that they may have you know liked and believed in, and now they see these people behaving um, like that. And I think. Also, a lot of it is just extreme frustration and anger because people have been cooped up under house arrest, effectively, in their homes for, for, for two months. Uh, a lot of people are angry about that as well. And now, you know, the, the lockdown is over. 
um, or nearly over. But uh, people are just, they've got so much energy to expend. And I suppose people have been let out and mm. and things, people have just got very wound up and just, just very angry generally. And uh, and this is what you get. You get these chaotic scenes. Um, not okay. not constructive at all, in my view. Kieran, uh, do you thought to the extent that um, there's probably a better way to go about this? Because, you know, I believe it was Columbus's statue, which was recently beheaded, I think, um, somewhere in the U.S. Uh, is that the way to go about this, to take this, to, to have the public take this issue into their own hands? I would disagree that uh, letter writing and gathering around to protest is going to make these monuments come down, uh, not in the United States. The um, these monuments have people have have done those things. Um, they've done them for you know decades, and no one's listening. And uh, there have been state laws passed that prevent uh, the removal of the monuments um, uh, that are uh, in states that are uh, run by conservative governments. Um, Yes, I think this is part of the, in, at least in the United States, the general frustration not only with um, uh, the economic downturn and uh, the pandemic, um, but it also has to do with uh, with our politics and also the longer history of, of uh, systemic racism in our country. Uh, and this, these monuments are symbols of that. And uh, honestly, um, I, I actually disagree that this doesn't do anything for their cause. I do believe that because of this um, uh, disruption uh, or eruption of, of, uh, of violence, I would say, against these monuments uh, has actually led to uh, other communities uh, throughout the South uh, to remove their monuments because of what has happened. You know, um, John, the arguments being on some parts, right, that um, these monuments represent history and even honor heritage. Uh, I know you know all those arguments, uh, even in the UK. Um, what do you what do you make of that? Because it seems that there is, for lack of a better term, whitewashing of history to an extent, right, where a lot of these men um, or others, women as well, possibly, uh, if there are such statues up, I'm not aware, but um, uh, who have taken part in some really bad activities during their lives, right? This is really, you know, oppressive practices. Um, King Leopold, for example, in, in Belgium, his, one of his, at least, statues has now been brought down in, in, a, in a town there, I believe, in Belgium. Um, and that was something that it was a long time coming, considering we all know the history of what he did in Africa. But, you know, there's, there's still a lot of people seemingly in these countries that look at these monuments and statues, and even the people that they represent, with uh, with a lot of awe and, and you know with a lot of positive energy, they don't realize the negativity behind that. What what are your thoughts on that? Statues should never have been there. Um, they need to be uh, removed as soon as possible. Um, absolutely, I, I agree with that. I just disagree that we can compare the situation now with protests um, and and attempts in the past um, to have these removed because I think now. Uh, we've got a, a movement um, which is so big and so united and it's really exploded. There's been a huge awakening and now we have social media um, and the internet. Um, and I really genuinely think that this can be achieved um, without chaotic scenes and without, um, in inverted commas, um, you know, violence. I think it could be achieved because of the sheer amount of people that are behind it now and social media and the internet, I think, uh, we're in a different time now, so I'm very positive, um, you know, about this awakening, you know, on this and that it can be achieved. But um, unfortunately, I, I feel that these protests of some of them have just got, um, you know, it's almost like they're defeating their their cause by by letting, you know, emotion and and and. Mm. That, passionate injustice. You know, I, I get that point, Jonathan, but, but on, on the yeah. point of people looking at these statues and even the men, for a large part, that, these, that they represent and their activities yeah. during their lives, uh, with a lot of fondness, right? There is a significant group of people in these respective countries that look at those people um, with yeah. a lot of fondness and say what they did was correct. That's troubling, is it not? Absolutely, and I can't imagine I mean, I know that there's the argument that, um, you know, it was a different time and that uh, we have to look at it in its historical context and that um, things were much more racist um, back then. That is the context. But at the same time, 
Um, I, I can't believe those statues are even there in the first place. I mean, I appreciate some of the statues are people who've got a mixture of, if you like, virtue and sin, so good and bad points in, in their history and their life. Like mm-hmm. Churchill, for example, it's a mixture with him. I can understand why you might leave that statue there, but statues that are associated with people that were so involved and so endorsing of slavery, I cannot believe that they were even allowed to be there in the first place. So I'm, mm. it's a real learning curve for me as well. I hadn't thought about it too much. Indeed. Why were right. they even there in the first place? Yeah, a fair point. And carry the final word before I let both of you go. Um, on this point of those who still look at these statues with all fondness and even the history um, of all of this, do you think that it is, as, as Jonathan there said, an awakening of sorts, even for, th- for those sorts of people, or do you think we'll just continue to see denial on their part? It, I, it's hard to know what they're feeling about this right now. I think it, it, for some of them it is an awakening. Um, for others, their, their feelings and beliefs about these monuments will become even more entrenched. Very well. We'll leave it there at that, but appreciate both Karen and Jonathan for their time today. Karen, they're speaking to us from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Jonathan was speaking to us there from Bournemouth in the UK. Uh, viewers, we've, we've spoken shortly about these colonial era and con- Confederate statues, monuments, etc., both in the US and the UK. In the UK, we've had a monument being brought down by protesters themselves. Even in the US, we've had um, a statue of Columbus, I believe it is, being beheaded, and of course, uh, a movement across many, many cities where these sorts of Confederate symbols exist to bring them down. Uh, nevertheless, there is then the backlash, right? Uh, even within the UK, you have now um, uh, some f- on the far right seemingly defending, quote unquote, these monuments. Um, and of course, uh, Jonathan brought up, you know, uh, Churchill. And of course, Churchill too is, is uh, controversial for many, many people in the UK at this time. And of course, these are all things that need to be debated. Um, is Jonathan's point about doing this in a calmer fashion relevant and correct and legitimate? Uh, as Karen there said, though, that has been tried, at least in the context of the US, where people have petitioned, have written um, to have have these sorts of things uh, brought down. However, cities have in fact protected those sorts of monuments instead of bringing them down, wanting to hold on to that history, uh, seemingly wanting to, you know, have that era remembered with a bit of fondness, which again is very troubling for many of us around the world who know the history, and even for American and UK citizens who very much know the history of these men and what they did during their lives. I'll be back after this break with my next segment. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilkar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss Canada. And now, as we know, with this anti-racism movement around the world, uh, a lot of countries' respective systemic racism uh, are coming out now into the open, right? So even a country like Canada, which has an image around the world as a peace-loving nation, a nation which is multicultural, which respects everybody, which treats everyone equally, etc., cetera, um, that is now, that facade is sort of being broken down, isn't it, in many people's eyes, especially those who are in Canada themselves, um, even though a lot of officials are denying that systemic racism even exists in Canada. So we've had the premiers of uh, pretty much the largest provinces in Canada, Ontario and Quebec, Uh, denying that there is systemic racism. And there's, of course, other officials as well, police chiefs and others around the country have also denied that systemic racism exists, at least within their respective communities. However, that um, has resulted in public backlash uh, to the extent where the Ontario Premier Doug Ford has now retracted his statement and, in fact, has now announced the creation of what he said was an advisory group that was already going to be set up to tackle inequality. Now, within the context of Canada, we can discuss many things, right? We can talk about the treatment of Indigenous people, people of color, certainly, and black community especially. I mean, in places like Toronto, we know that uh, a black person is more likely to be stopped by a policeman than a person of any other uh, race or ethnicity, uh, especially, of course, those who are white Canadians. Then there's, of course, uh, arguments made about the immigration system being points-based. All of the above um, have been of concern for those who have been following these issues for a very long time. Let's try to discuss all of that a bit further, if we can, with our panelists. Uh, we're now joined by Leith Maruf, who is usually based in Montreal, but he's joining us from Beirut. He's an award-winning multimedia producer and a media policy and law consultant. His media work includes issues of liberation and decolonization of indigenous nations. We're also joined from Calgary by Zane Velji, who is a partner at Northwestern, uh, at Northweather, pardon me. Uh, and he has managed campaigns for candidates in Canada, including Calgary Mayor 
Uh, he, and she, who is North America's first Muslim mayor, uh, he's also a campaign strategist. Uh, Zain and Leith, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Leith, let me start with you if I can. Um, we had Doug Ford and the, and the Quebec Premier come out and deny systemic racism, right? Um, even though I believe uh, Trudeau did sort of admit that there is systemic racism within Canada, uh, how important is it, do you think, as a first step for at least officials to accept that this is an issue? Well, it is better than nothing, but uh, Canada is built on the genocide of the indigenous people that is continuing uh, right now. Uh, a lot of people are speaking about racism against black uh, Africans in Canada or the United States or Arabs and Muslims uh, in Canada and the U.S., but we seem to forget that uh, Canada has an original sin uh, that is continuing. And in fact, in Canada, uh, indigenous people are more likely to be jailed or killed uh, by the police uh, and the state than even uh, black people or uh, Muslims and Arabs. So, uh, you know, it is a, a good beginning, but uh, a lot of times what we see in the West uh, and in Canada specifically, is uh, just uh, um, cosmetic changes to how the system oppresses its uh, minorities or the indigenous people. Zain, you know, the issue of indigenous is an important one, isn't it, um, within the context of Canada? Do you think that um, the likes of Trudeau and, and other officials have done a good enough job to address the many issues surrounding how they are treated? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and I think Leith would have the, the context and the broader understanding of it significantly more. But what I will say from the political front, I'd say that Justin Trudeau here in Canada has taken what many would call significant symbolic steps. Uh, and so in his first term, you know, really pushing forward on ensuring that there was Indigenous representation in his cabinet. Uh, if, if those uh, who are watching do not know, he had a very strong uh, uh, indigenous candidate that was his justice minister. She is now gone. Um, and, and that kind of uh, rubbed many people who were uh, quite excited about that the wrong way. Uh, his pushing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was the, the set of principles that would really allow Canada to, to, to reconcile with its past, to what Leith was mentioning. Uh, of how we treat Indigenous people, how we continue to treat Indigenous people, whether that be uh, the historical trauma from residential schools or the, the, the trauma related to, to mental health issues and, and the reservations here in Canada for Indigenous people. Uh, and all of those steps, while he has taken them, many of them are to be largely symbolic. So I don't think he's closed the bracket in any stretch whatsoever. Uh, but I think for those who are looking for symbolic measures, they were on the table. The question now is, just like the question is with Justin Trudeau being the first world leader to take the knee at the Black Lives Matter protest, the symbolism was great. But when are we going to have the action that really and truly brings change? Now, many people would, would say, uh, and at a footnote, that that change is going to take decades, if not generations, to complete. But I think people are getting a little bit impatient uh, with the symbolism uh, and are now wanting to see a little bit more action uh, concretely being delivered on these things. So uh, the simple matter of, is, Wakard, like I think many people would say his heart's in the right place, but but there is a few elements that uh, that they're now being soured on because the action is just not there. Indeed, and that's, that seems to be the jury right now, right, Leith, where we have this, this, this momentum to bring all of this out into the open around the world, and of course, even in a place like Canada. Um, and as I said in my introduction, you know, as Canadians, we know that our country has this image in the world, right, uh, which, which doesn't exactly parallel what we know happens within the country, be it to Indigenous or others. Um, do you think that we're going to move beyond the symbolic actions and actually do something quite relevant and quite significant towards, be it the indigenous or other people of color communities? Well, you know, last year, the indigenous uh, nations uh, were fighting the building of uh, a, um, oil, oil pipes and gas pipes uh, across their uh, sovereign territories. And the Canadian government responded with uh, sending in militarized police and mass arresting uh, leaders of the indigenous nations and uh, those who were in solidarity with them and even arresting and charging media that was trying to cover uh, those protests. So in, in Canada, there's a reality, which is uh, 
Canada is a colonial settler state based on uh, the supremacy of English or French uh, settlers, and uh, that that reality uh, contradicts the uh, you know the rhetoric of uh, Canada, the liberal state, and that always comes into a head when the indigenous people decide to assert their uh, sovereignty and their national rights. So, you know, while, while Trudeau, uh, you know, likes to use these uh, liberal uh, symbolic gestures, in reality, he actually achieves more oppression uh, and steals more of the indigenous people than, let's say, a conservative leader could because uh, they don't have even that, uh, um, you know, symbolic gestures that cover up their crimes. And so when we uh, try to look at uh, how Canada treated uh, the indigenous people in the last even you know few decades, you see a huge militarization of uh, dealing with them. Uh, there's thousands uh, upon thousands of indigenous women that are disappeared and are missing, and the police are doing nothing about them because they are undesirable to the state. Um, and you know if you look at you know coming back to Quebec, and Ontario, both uh, provinces uh, had elected uh, extreme right-wing uh, governments uh, in the last few years. Um, the premiers of Quebec and Ontario are basically white nationalists right now. That's how you can view them. And uh, they they are under pressure because of this international um, media coverage of what's happening in Canada and the United States. But uh, they, they're trying to kind of... Uh, outlive this media coverage so they can return back to their uh, genocidal and colonial policies when the international media is not looking. You know, that, that's the issue, isn't it, for, for many of us, Zain, who talk about this, right, as Canadians, that a lot of the public uh, doesn't seem to, A, be aware of this sort of thing. And, and if I may, uh, you know, say this, a lot of them don't seem to care too much about this. And I'm speaking about, of course, I'm generalizing uh, in quite a vast manner but do you think that that is uh, a, a huge obstacle that 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 you're possibly dealing with when you talk about this with people as well that you know getting people to actually care about this um something that may not directly affect them in their daily lives it's it's a great question because i i feel like as much as we tout in canada that we're a officially a multicultural country one of the few if not only in a Western democracy that has an ingrained policy of multiculturalism. One of the most interesting things about Canada that almost contrasts that, Wakar, is that we have a very poor understanding of some of the first principles as it relates to race. You know, when you had the two premiers of Quebec and Ontario describe the fact that they didn't think systemic racism exists, I bet you they couldn't actually describe what systemic racism was. Right. And, and one of the reasons I feel like that exists here in Canada is because we're just not as race conscious. And that cuts both ways. Uh, the positive way, some might say, is that we're not race conscious, which then makes us focus on the similarities, how we're more similar, how Canada is a country of meritocracy. You know, we've got all these similarities. Why focus on the differences? Well, if you if you focus just on the similarities of, of how we're so similar as Canadians for decades, if not generations, what you lose out on when you turn a blind eye to the differences is how the differences that we have as people, especially on a race-based case, is that is that we didn't ignore the systemic sort of challenges, the systemic hurdles, the systemic differences that black, indigenous, Muslim, East Asian Canadians might feel, uh, those that might be of a sexual minority might feel. And what ends up happening is that when, when a time like this presents itself, bubbles itself up to not just an, an, an American surface, but a world surface, Canada is caught flat-footed because we just don't have the literacy to discuss these things in an open way that, that a place, even like America, we, we, even with all its challenges, has the tools, instruments, and advocacy vehicles to discuss. Yeah. So the great irony of Canada is as much as we consider ourselves multicultural, we just don't even have some of the first principle tools to discuss these things uh, at a systems-based level across the country. You know, that's the issue, isn't it, Leith, that, that a lot of us are just ignorant, unfortunately, about these issues. You know, uh, we don't know about the reservations, for example, in Ontario itself, who 
possibly don't have running water or how reservations in, in provinces like Saskatchewan, you know, where I've been and I've seen those reservations from afar, of course, but um, just hearing those stories, those harrowing stories about what reality, daily life reality is like, I imagine for a lot of Canadians, it's something that doesn't even come on their radar. That's a problem, isn't it? It, uh, and worked on um, many reservations, and which is for me a, a ridiculous name. Um, uh, it's like uh, saying a reservation for some animals or um, plants. You know, this is how, you know, it starts from even the name of the place. But, you know, I visited all these places and worked in, in, in them, uh, building uh, media capacities within these indigenous communities. And I can tell you, uh, as a Palestinian, uh, they're worse than uh, some of the refugee camps that I've seen here in Lebanon. Um, you know, there's uh, no running water. There's uh, many houses with broken uh, windows, and it's uh, minus 40 degrees outside for most of the year in those locations. So it, it is a, a horrendous situation, no health care, no education. Um, but, you know, part of the main problem in Canada is that there is these two competing white settler colonial uh, communities, uh, the English and the French. And uh, they uh, constantly speak about how they are being discriminated against by each other. So the majority of the space, uh, media space or public space to speak about discrimination is occupied by the English and the French who are complaining about each other's oppression. And then uh, when there's just a little bit of space left, uh, that is also then occupied by the dichotomy of indigenous versus white settler. So finally, when you get to the issues of oppression of uh, uh, people from African diaspora, Arabs, Muslims, Asians, uh, and Latin Americans, there is almost no time to speak about that. And, and uh, it, is, it looks almost ridiculous. But you know, Canada is right now uh, 20, 23, 24% uh, visible minorities that are non-white and another 5% of uh, indigenous populations. Mm. And, uh, but, but again, you look at what's happening in Quebec, you, you, you hear this uh, constantly, the Quebecois uh, francophone uh, settlers uh, speaking of themselves as if they are the most oppressed peoples in Canada, it, it, to the point of the ridiculous term of calling themselves the white niggers of uh, North America. This is how, how much internalized uh, this, this white, uh, mm. uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, rivalry between the English and the French uh, mm. is in Canada, and it takes so much space. Very well. We'll leave there as a final, but we appreciate both Leith and Zane for their time today and, of course, for sharing their expert insight with us. Of course, as I said, viewers, Canada has an image right around the world of a peace-loving nation, a multicultural nation, uh, a nation that treats all of its citizens and residents equally, but that's not obviously the case. The reality on the ground is quite different. The Indigenous are not treated equally. They're not even treated well, period, even though they are the original inhabitants of that land, um, though there is some recognition in some quarters but again, that's left to more symbolic measures than anything else, as Zen there had mentioned. And that is, of course, a worry because we need to move beyond the symbolism. And as Lather then pointed out, uh, we've had this Francophone versus Anglophone uh, issue within Canada for a very long time now, where Quebecois always feel that they are being the ones left out in the cold. Um, nevertheless, then when you come down to speaking about other minorities and the indigenous and then the Arabs and Muslims, et cetera, who are also then uh, oppressed or, or treated or badly in some fashion or the other by police or the system, um, you're left with very little space and very little time to discuss all of the above them. And of course, these are topics which are very important and now have come out into the open through this global anti-racism movement that we're all witnessing. I'll be back with my next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilkar Vizby. In this segment, we're going to discuss police reforms. Now, that's been spoken of, right, as the next step, uh, be it within the U.S. or in other places around the world where we now know systemic racism exists and that all that has now come out into the open uh, because of this global anti-racism movement ever since the killing of George Floyd. Now, um, within the context of the U.S., Democrats have proposed wide-ranging reforms for police. Um, there's also a lot of talk about disbanding slash defunding police departments. Uh, one of the examples 
Michael's used a lot is Camden, New Jersey, even though many people say the track record there is, is a mixed bag, is not all positive necessarily. Um, then there's, of course, the tactics that police use. So even in countries like France, uh, they're now banning the chokehold technique, the very technique that killed the likes of George Floyd, as well as Eric Garner, you remember, a number of years ago. Um, and there's, of course, just a lot of uh, concern about exactly what is to happen next, right? Uh, do you just get rid of police altogether? Because then the argument is, OK, if you don't have police, then how do you keep communities safe, um, et cetera? So we need some system going forward which addresses the very legitimate concerns, but at the same time keeps communities safe uh, at the same time. So let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're now joined by Caroline Noblesarnoff, who is executive director of the Justice Laboratory at Yale Law School. She's a criminologist and she's joining us now from New Haven, Connecticut. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Rashawn Ray, who is a Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings Institution. He's a sociologist. Rashawn and Caroline, thank you both for your time this morning. Uh, Caroline, let me start with you. What do you make of uh, the need for, of course, police reforms and how exactly one goes about doing that in a reasonable fashion? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me this morning. And I think you nailed it in your opening, which is how do we chart the plausible path forward towards a transformational change while also reducing immediate harm? I think that, you you know, you mentioned the Democrats uh, had their Judiciary Committee hearing yesterday to talk about these immediate reforms. And what you're seeing is this urge to just do something right now. Um, and we can do that through a bunch of different things, right? Whether that's really focusing on reducing use of force, like the chokeholds or uh, training that focuses on de-escalation. And then, you know, they're also talking about how can we be smart about how we are reinvesting this money in our communities and empowering the community to be the producer or a co-producer of public safety. Mm -hmm. um, so we certainly are seeing, I think, these two ide ideologies meeting in the middle a little bit about, right, how can we really reduce the footprint of the police? Um, but in the meantime, let's be realistic here. This is not going to turn on a dime, right? So we need to be smart about how we can take immediate steps as we work towards a total transformation of policing in America. Indeed. So, Roshan, how does one find that middle ground, right? Because uh, you know that there, there, are, there is that extreme on one side, which just says defund the police and put that money towards uh, the respective communities, be it commun the black community or others, uh, which need that money for respective different programs or retrain police, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of ideas and theories out there about what to do, but the, I, I imagine the most extreme is defunding police. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Because, again, from the outside, looking from the outside in, that see that sounds you know good at, at one level where it's like okay you deal with the main issue of police brutality but then how do you keep communities safe then? Yeah, I think part of it is really helping people to conceptualize what defund means. It essentially means reallocation, and I think it's important to have a, a reset to understand why some people think that that should be a possibility. Only about ten percent of calls for service for police departments deal with violent crime. It doesn't mean that when they arrive that something violent might occur or that someone might have a weapon. But overall, police officers are responding to everything from potholes being in the street to a cat being up in the tree to uh, people who are dealing with suicidal ideation and addiction. And I think what people are saying is that there are mental health specialists who can help with suicidal ideation that there, are, that there are, are, are addiction specialists who can help deal with addiction. And so part of it is a reallocation, which I think is a better framework, a reallocation based on needs and based on cause. And so I think the defunding argument is really about saying that we aren't spending money the way we should, in particular when it comes to investing money in education and work infrastructure, which we know will reduce crime. Hmm. I imagine that the likes of police unions, like, like the one we saw, the gentleman representing in New York, I believe it was, um, who was very, very, of course, emotional about when he was speaking about, you know, how police were, that we, we were now in an anti-police atmosphere, et cetera. I imagine none of the above would go down without a fight, right? Because there's a lot of money involved here, isn't there? There's a lot of funding that goes towards these police departments. I mean, they get a lot of funding for the likes of equipment that we're now seeing being used on the streets of America. Absolutely. And 
I think a lot of people don't understand just from a quick glance how complicated police budgets are and how complicated these relationships with the unions are. I, I, a huge part of the budget goes to things like pensions, and this is money that can't automatically be reassigned, right? It's already promised to people. So just right there, you're talking about a massive conversation to change a pension policy. Um, I, I think also, you know, Dr. Ray is making a very good point about this ter term defund. And we could we can use a, a more positive language, you know, to reinvest that money in our community, to reallocate that money in our community. That's the language that we need to use here, this positive connotation language. Um, as far as is it not going to go down without a fight? Um, I think you're probably right about that. I mean, history would certainly tell us that this is um, there's a lot of power in the police union. There's a lot of power. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, one of my concerns about how this is going to play out is a lot of unions have policies that are sort of first in, first out. You've probably seen some other people talking about this, which means if the unions get involved and are forced to slash their budgets and slash their personnel, they're going to be taking out the younger more progressive, maybe more amenable to change cops. And the people who are going to stay are going to be the career, the veteran police officers. Indeed. So, so how exactly does one then overcome those obstacles, Rashawn? Because police unions are very strong, as I put to Caroline as well. You know, all this equipment, uh, the, the quote unquote militarization of America's police, right, especially in some uh, precincts. Um, a lot of those precincts, of course, are communities of, or, of, of people of color, right? So how does one overcome that? How does one convince those unions, those police departments that this is the right thing to do? So I think it's twofold. So I wrote a piece called Bad Apples Come from Rotten Trees and Policing at Brookings. And I think what we have to do is the first thing that we have to do is we have to firmly get people to understand that we're trying to reduce officer-involved killings, or what some people would call police killings. What I've argued for is restructuring civilian payouts for police misconduct. This will take money that's normally paid out to uh, people who experience police brutality in their family. So eventually, George Floyd's family will receive a large civil settlement. Their taxpayer money will be used to pay them back for the vilification, dehumanization, and murder of their loved one. In Chicago, Chicago, Illinois, spent over $600 million over the past two decades on police misconduct claims. Imagine if that money went to education and work, particularly on the south side of Chicago. So I think instead, we have police department insurances this is similar to the healthcare model that hospitals use. But I also think that we have to extend an olive branch to police officers. They are not robots, they are human beings. And they are overstressed, overworked, and overpaid. And some of the research I've done suggests there are two other policy solutions we could put in place to really advance policing and improve community policing. One is providing housing subsidies for law enforcement. Now, some places have done this, like Philly, and even though they've had issues since then, it's a good program to put police officers in the neighborhoods that they interact in. The second thing is we need mental health counseling. About 80% of police officers suffer from chronic stress. 90% of them never seek help. About 20% suffer from substance abuse and suicidal thoughts. This is because they have too much on their plate. So part of reallocating or reinvesting, as we just heard, is a good way to think about it. And then instead, we could put money toward housing for, uh, for officers to help with their pay, to help them be in the community, to really engage in community policing, as well as to provide psychological services for them. Caroline, I'll give you the final word, letting you both go. Um, uh, you know, it, it, there is at some times it does feel like, you know, like the gentleman that I said earlier, I forget his name right now, who represented the police union there in New York when he had spoken very emotionally about the very anti-police atmosphere that we're in. It does sometimes feel like it's overwhelming sometimes, again, looking from the outside in. Um, do you think that Rashan's, you know, approach where the police need to, be, need to be brought into the fore, really, and their sort of viewpoint needs to be understood better, that that's an important approach as well. Because, you know, the likes of the techniques of the chokehold and others that we've seen used on George Floyd or Eric Garner, I mean, that those things were apparently already outlawed in places like New York a while back, but are still being used. So, I mean, it goes to show that there's something wrong even within the training of police still. So 
there, there's a lot to unpack there. We'll go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start yeah. by saying, you sure. know, to answer your first question, what is an appropriate amount of input from the police as part of this conversation? And I think this gets to the root of the problem, which is we have never in America as a community community articulated what dem democratic policing should look and feel like. We tried to do this a little bit in the 1960s with the Kerner Commission, and we did not devote the time and the energy to really answer this question. So if we're going to move forward at all, we have to decide what does policing look like? What do we want it to do? You know, D uh, Dr. Ray, said it so clearly, there are things that we can, how we can displace, you know, uh, their resources and invest in different ways, but we need to articulate what people want and, and officer wellness and their safety is a part of that as well. So sure, they should have a seat at the table. Um, we're certainly not going to get over the challenge of compliance if they do not perceive this this force uh, to change policing as legitimate. And it's only going to be perceived as legitimate from police and the community if everyone has a voice and how this change happens. Yep, and that makes a lot of sense. I'll leave it there at that. But of course, we appreciate both Caroline and Rashawn for their time this morning. Caroline, they're speaking to us from New Haven, and Rashawn is always speaking to us there from Washington, D.C. Um, we've tried to give you the context, or our guests have tried to give you the context, viewers, about how policing. Uh, may be reformed within the United States. Of course, that debate is currently happening where Democrats have put forward a proposal. There's a proposal about, about defunding police departments. Rashawn was able to describe for us what exactly that means at this time. It's not about just getting rid of all police because you certainly need some form of policing of respective communities, but we need the community as well to get involved as well as other forms of experts to deal with different sorts of situations where a normal police officer may not be the best person to get involved, uh, especially situations which are not necessarily criminal in nature, more dealing with mental health or otherwise. Uh, so there's, of course, a lot of a debate happening. And of course, all of this has now come out into the open, thankfully. Uh, hopefully that that be a positive thing and this not just be brushed under the carpet as it has in the past. But it seems now that the momentum is pushing for proper changes to be made. Uh, and hopefully those changes will be made in a fashion where they've been properly studied before they're implemented so that this is something that can be implemented long term and work for the community as well as respective police departments as well in tandem. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.